Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, so we titled this Geographically Appropriate Integrated Agriculture. I'll focus, I think, on the, the integrated part especially. Um, how do we pull together uh, not just uh, crop production, but the production of a whole range of other uh, services and, uh, and products from agro-ecosystems? And how do we do that in a way that's um, globally appropriate in terms of the, the uh, site conditions that are that are there now and also the ones that are changing. Uh, this is partly um, <clears throat> uh, part of a project uh, called the Economics of Land Degradation. It's uh, funded by, ultimately by the UN and through some, uh, some German, German colleagues. And I'll point out my, um, <clears throat> my colleagues also working on this project, Ida Kubiszewski and Kat Chermen, who are here today. Um, <clears throat> we live in a, in a different world these days. We live in a whole, what's been called a, a whole new geologic era, the Anthropocene, as it's called. Who's heard that term, Anthropocene? Let's see how widely it's been skidding around now, okay. Just because of the magnitude of human influence on the planet. Uh, we, don't, we don't live in a world that has a lot of <clears throat> natural capital any longer. You know, it's full of humans and their artifacts. I think this changes a lot of things about how we think about the world, how we think about humans' place in the world. And I think it forces us to do a lot more uh, <clears throat> conscious management uh, if we really want to have a sustainable and desirable future. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, and, and part of the reason for that is the uh, intensification of land use and the transition from uh, a world which was largely natural ecosystems uh, to frontier clearing and then subsistence agriculture and small scale farms and, and on to uh, more intensive agriculture and more urbanization um, in combination with uh, protected areas and some remaining uh, natural areas. And I think the, uh, <clears throat> the challenge here is what's, what's the appropriate balance? What is the appropriate, geographically appropriate uh, balance of, of these activities? They're going to maximize both the, the quality of life for people now and the sustainability of that uh, quality of life into the, into the future. Um, <clears throat> this is from a, a paper by John Foley and colleagues a couple of years ago, uh, just looking at the extent globally of croplands and pasture and rangelands and uh, comparing that with the, uh, the natural vegetation pattern across the planet. Uh, you've probably all seen uh, versions of this uh, just to show you where, <clears throat> where things are. Uh, but <clears throat> we also know that we are bumping up against and, and uh, probably have already succeed, exceeded the uh, safe operating space for, for humans on the planet. Uh, the, we, this, uh, this paper you've probably uh, seen uh, was an attempt to identify what, what the planetary values were in terms of these nine variables. Um, and this, uh, we concluded that um, we're probably already outside the safe operating space on at least three of those. Climate change, obviously, biodiversity loss, and, uh, and the nitrogen cycle, and several others are rapidly approaching uh, the, the safe operating space. Um, so we're, uh, we're changing the world in very significant ways, and that's having an effect on the provision of uh, ecosystem services, the benefits that people uh, derive from functioning ecosystems. This is from uh, the, the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, from a few years ago. Um, who's heard the term ecosystem services? Okay. Even more than the folks, that's good. Um, so you know what I'm talking about here, and uh, the, the um, Millennium Assessment categorizes in these four broad groups of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. Obviously, food is a, is a, uh, is a major one there. Um, and, and their effects on various aspects of, uh, of human well-being. So it's not just marketed pr uh, production, but a whole range of other uh, other services that affect human well-being. Um, one thing that's missing from this diagram, I would say, is um, <clears throat> the, the fact that these services don't just flow from nature into, into human well-being. There's a, uh, an interaction between uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, built infrastructure, uh, human capital, and social capital. It's all required uh, in order to make this transition from a functioning natural system, and the natural capital, uh, into um, well-being. Uh, so uh, there's, there's not a direct flow there, but there's uh, a required interaction. Uh, it makes studying ecosystem services, it makes actually studying uh, the economy really a, a, um, a, an inherently transdisciplinary uh, kind of activity. 
Uh, we have to change our fundamental paradigm about it. Uh, how humans fit with the rest of nature and, and stop conceiving of the economy as, uh, as something separate from the rest of nature, but something that's integrated together with all the rest of the system. It's a much broader, broader view. Um, and recognizes that the economy is embedded in, is embedded within society, which is embedded in uh, the rest of nature. So we've got to think of this uh, as, a, uh, as an interconnected, as an integrated system. Um, and certainly agriculture within, within that, uh, that system. So here's a little more complicated picture of how, how that might work, that um, we have to first of all recognize we live in a materially closed Earth system. There are fundamental ecological constraints and, and planetary boundaries. We have to recognize that these four basic types of capital or assets are all required to produce any sort of human well-being. And it extends beyond our built capital and our human capital of individual people, but, but that includes their education, their health. But it also includes our social capital, all of the interactions among, uh, among people, both formal and informal networks and, and institutions. And uh, you know, the market itself is a form of social capital. And that's all embedded within our natural capital infrastructure, uh, the rest of nature, all of our natural ecosystems. Uh, they affect um, how goods and services are produced, marketed goods and services, but they also affect uh, human well-being uh, more directly. So it also in involves recognizing that human well-being is a much more complex function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are. Uh, it has to do with our, uh, our natural capital or our social capital as well. So. Um, <clears throat> we're beginning to be able to, to do a much better job of both understanding those connections and mapping those, those assets. And I think going forward, we need to look at um, <clears throat> how uh, human natural built and social capital are all distributed around the planet uh, and how they interact uh, to affect sustainable well-being. <clears throat> um, and when it comes to agriculture, uh, it's a question of uh, moving perhaps uh, from uh, natural ecosystems, which produced uh, a large range of ecosystem services and uh, in, in very small amounts of, of uh, crop, if you want to call it that, uh, to more intensive cropland where those ecosystem services have been sacrificed in the name of, of uh, increased crop production. So maybe more diverse systems where we're, we're uh, optimizing the joint production of all of those uh, kinds of outputs. So we think of, of agriculture not as just producing crops, but agriculture and agro-ecosystems as producing this whole range of, of, uh, of goods and services. Uh, and, <clears throat> and this is really, a, uh, I think, a design problem. How do you design systems that, uh, that can give us a more optimal uh, production processes? Um, <clears throat> I'll just plug this recent book that we have uh, coming out on uh, ecosystem services from agricultural and urban landscapes. I think uh, that part of the ecosystem services agenda has, uh, has, has, uh, has not been emphasized up until recently. So most of the previous work on ecosystem services has been about quote unquote natural ecosystems, the ones with, with very, uh, fairly small amounts of human intervention. Uh, but I think that's rapidly changing as some of the issues that we talked about today become more important. How do we, how do we actually live sustainably and well in the Anthropocene? Um, and I'll, um, I'll give one example of, of a very interesting study, I think that was done by Ian Bateman and colleagues uh, out of the UK um, <clears throat> as part of a large uh, ecosystem services assessment that they did there. Um, and they looked at um, a range of outputs and they basically concluded that, well, the UK is largely going to be farm, you know, so it's, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, scenarios for the future, it's what do they do, how do they manage that, that farm. And they looked at uh, both uh, traditional agricultural production, uh, the sequestering of greenhouse gases, recreational amenities, and uh, urban green space amenities. And they also looked at, um, at biodiversity as uh, measured by wild bird species diversity. A small subset, I would say, of all of the ecosystem services involved, uh, but enough uh, to give you quite a, uh, a different picture of, of some of the future of the UK than, than you might otherwise get. They looked at these six different uh, scenarios um, going forward <clears throat> um, that had to do with uh, different 
types of environmental regulation and planning policy relative to the current situation and, uh, <clears throat> and the spatial focusing of the, of the changes. And you can see from the names of these and the, and the combination of the uh, uh, environmental regulation and spatial patterns uh, what <clears throat> the kinds of things they're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> the two that I'll, I'll talk more about are the, uh, the world market scenario where they have weak environmental regulation and it's focused on uh, losses of green belt to urban development versus the nature at work where they have strong environmental regulation <clears throat> and greening of urban and peri-urban areas to enhance recreation values. Uh, but <clears throat> the paper gets into a lot of detail on several of these. But those two scenarios, for example, what they end up doing is looking at <clears throat> uh, what happens to the market values uh, in the future, uh, <clears throat> the value of agricultural product, products in terms of uh, pounds per hectare per year, uh, but then what also, also what happens to the non-market values, the greenhouse gas emissions, recreation, and their urban amenities in this case, and, uh, and finally what happens to their biodiversity uh, index. And you can see the, the world market scenario <clears throat> uh, increases you know, agricultural production largely, uh, but uh, is negative in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, largely negative in terms of recreation, except right around major urban areas, and, uh, <clears throat> and largely uh, negative in terms of urban, urban green space, while the reverse is true of the, the nature at work uh, in, in many cases. Um, <clears throat> the bottom line was this, I think, quite dramatic result, uh, that if they look at the changes in value uh, from the present day to 2000. 2060, uh, achieved by targeting these different policies, if you aim to maximize just the market value of these, uh, of these systems, uh, then there's a, a net increase in that value, but uh, several of the other things um, go down significantly. This is the net effect. If you maximize all the monetary values that they, were, they included there, the greenhouse gas emissions, the recreational amenities, <coughs> carbon sequestration, um, you get a reduction in the agricultural value, but a, a large increase in the other values. So you get a major, almost a, a more than an order of magnitude increase in the total value of the landscape, if you want to think of it that way. Um, then they said, well, what happens if you did the same thing, but you constrained it uh, with the biodiversity constraints? You want to minimize the loss of biodiversity, and they, they found that that didn't change things very much. They could get this uh, without losing very much in terms of uh, biodiversity. <clears throat> so quite an interesting result, and it just goes to show the magnitude of the difference in conclusions that you might get by focusing only on the ag production versus focusing on a broader spectrum of uh, products and services. Um, this idea of scenario planning, I think in general, is a, um, a good way to try to integrate many of the factors that we've been uh, talking about here today, and also uh, to communicate uh, with a much broader audience. We did a project uh, in Iowa <clears throat> a few years ago uh, that tried to do that for agriculture uh, in, in, uh, in Iowa and generated a, a, a series of scenarios which had very different spatial patterns, they had very different uh, sort of uh, views of the landscape, um, and uh, I think they're also very differently perceived by the, uh, the various stakeholders. And we hadn't taken this to the same level of analyzing the, uh, the value of those services as the UK study did, but I think if you did that, you get uh, some fairly similar results. Uh, it's also possible to do this, uh, this is just an example from Australia I thought you might be interested in. Uh, we did something similar for uh, the Great Barrier Reef and its catchment, uh, looking at a range of different scenarios, what impacts that would have uh, not only on the, uh, the terrestrial system, but also on the uh, the marine system and the, uh, the reef itself, and uh, <clears throat> how different, changing different patterns, both uh, of management on the landscape and of uh, sort of global uh, climate change, how that would affect uh, the future of the, of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so, we know also, this is from, also from the uh, Millennium Assessment, that, that many of the transitions these days from intact natural systems to, uh, to more agro systems, uh, if done in, uh, in the conventional way, leads to a, a net decrease in the value of those, of those systems, if you include the value of the ecosystem services we've been, we've been talking about. Uh, so the, the private benefits may increase, but the social benefits uh, generally decrease by, by quite a large uh, margin. Um, we did a study uh, at the global scale to try to 
estimate what's the benefit cost ratio of preserving, conserving, or restoring our natural capital assets globally. And that was based on a uh, uh, scenario of increasing the global uh, reserve, terrestrial reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost about $45 billion a year to implement and maintain. Uh, but the net benefits, the difference between the intact system and what it most likely would be converted to was on the order of four to five trillion dollars a year. So uh, benefit cost ratio of 100 to one. So it's an amazingly good investment in, in, any, uh, in any market. Uh, but these are largely social benefits and, uh, and, and private costs. Um, <clears throat> it's also possible to look at uh, the range of uh, benefits from these ecosystem services across uh, different, um, different ecosystems. And this is a, a recent study that's been updated with um, <coughs> uh, well over a thousand different individual studies. So it's kind of a meta-analysis of uh, the estimates of the value of ecosystem services from these different systems. Um, <coughs> and you can see that there's uh, you know, quite a large range, but also uh, quite, quite large medians and, and and, and average values uh, to you know, uh, coral reefs, which are, are more than you know, $100,000 per hectare per year in terms of the total value of the services that they provide. Um, <clears throat> we did a study back in 1997 that looked at um, aggregating all of these values globally and uh, <clears throat> came up with uh, an estimate in current dollars. This is around $2,007 that came out to be $45 trillion a year. And then we looked at the changes in land and land use uh, between 2011 and 1997. And, uh, <clears throat> many of the high value systems have been uh, uh, being lost, uh, coral reefs, for example, uh, at the expense of some lower value systems. If you look at the, the overall net change, I won't go into the details here, but uh, <clears throat> if you look at the, uh, the change in value between those two years, uh, because largely of land use change, also from better, having better estimates of the uh, unit values of these systems, it ends up being somewhere in the range of four to twenty trillion dollars a year in terms of the loss of value. So we're converting these systems into less valuable, from a social point of view, um, ecosystems or agro ecosystems. How do we how do we go about changing that? Uh, well, I think we need a better um, systems level understanding of these. Uh, these uh, interactions. Um, we need to do better integrated modeling uh, of humans embedded in ecological systems. And that's going to involve, there's no one right way to do this. I think it's going to involve a, a uh, intelligent pluralism, as they call it. Uh, a lot of different approaches with a lot of com uh, comparing the results and, and testing them so we can't go down one, <coughs> one particular uh, route. Uh, it's going to have to be multiple scales in time and space and, uh, and complexity. Uh, so we can't solve this problem by just looking at individual farms or uh, global scale uh, phenomena. Uh, we've got to have a way to do these things at multiple scales. Um, it also needs to involve uh, stakeholders in a more uh, open, consensus building kind of process. So it's not just scientists producing models, it's scientists involving uh, <coughs> Uh, stakeholders from the from the beginning of the process, from the, the uh, stage of conceptualizing uh, the models and developing them, and all the way through, acknowledging uncertainty and limits of predictability, the values that stakeholders bring to this process, and also recognizing that these things occur over long historical periods, and you have to incorporate that and the uh, <coughs> the evolutionary, the co-evolutionary processes that occur between humans and the rest of nature. Um, one example, just point two, uh, is uh, a model that we did at the global scale, uh, but um, differentiated by these 11 uh, biomes that looked at the dynamics of ecosystem services over the time period from uh, 1900 to 2100, and how they all interacted in a, in a more integrated way. So I would call this an, an integrated dynamic model of the system. That also, I think, can be and, and needs to be done for at the uh, in a spatially explicit way at the, the landscape scale. So there's been a lot of uh, landscape level <coughs> um, modeling that uh, combines the, both the uh, ecological and the natural system components of, of these systems. And ultimately, I think we need to, to build more multi-scale integrated models that, that can get at 
uh, ecosystem services are trying to change uh, as a result of the, these complex factors that we've, uh, we've all been talking about. Uh, one interesting example I thought I'd show, because I think this one is really uh, cool, is uh, this model of the, the, the collapse of the Maya civilization that we've done recently. Uh, that, that's, that is in this general mode. Uh, the advantage of looking historically is you can get much longer time periods. You can look at civilizations that, that grew and, uh, and eventually were not sustainable. So if you want to study sustainability, it's good to know what doesn't work as well as what might work. And so this is kind of an integrated systems dynamics and agent-based model that, <clears throat> that covers whole, this whole range of variables, including uh, the human population, human capital, the, the uh, natural capital and ecosystem services, uh, some of the economics and the trade networks, and we're able to reproduce the collapse of the, the Maya civilization. And go back and, and uh, ask questions like, well, what could they have done differently? Could they have uh, <clears throat> managed their natural capital and their their trade network uh, better manage their population, uh, stabilize that system. <clears throat> so, um, and finally, what we're working on now is uh, is actually adding uh, some uh, a uh, an engaging sort of game interface uh, to these kinds of, of complex landscape scale models uh, that <clears throat> uh, that will allow us to do um, I think a range of of, uh, of new kinds of research and also um, to better uh, educate uh, the general public about how these complex systems work. Uh, so <clears throat> we want to build games that combine entertainment, education, and, uh, and research. Uh, an interesting statistic I've heard recently is that we now spend over three billion dollars per week, people do, uh, playing, uh, playing computer games. <clears throat> um, that's a lot of time and effort. If we can engage at least some small fraction of that effort, uh, in useful kinds of games, as they're, as they're called, uh, that are also educational, <clears throat> that I think we could do uh, a lot um, better and, and more kinds of uh, research about both how people understand these complex systems, we can uh, be educated about them, but we can also observe how they value different components of the system, <clears throat> how they make trade-offs in these systems, how the, that behavior changes over time. In these game environments, you can keep track of every decision that every every player makes, and uh, you can, uh, <clears throat> can use that in a, in a lot of interesting ways. So um, <clears throat> our next step is uh, we have a workshop coming up next week in uh, New Zealand at Lincoln University that will, that will work on <clears throat> developing some of these ideas about mapping, modeling, and data acquisition for large-scale sustainable land management analysis that feeds into this uh, economics of land degradation project. Uh, but I, 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 that will also help us uh, to develop um, better, more geographically uh, <coughs> appropriate, integrated uh, agriculture. And finally, I'll point to a, um, a journal that we produced, because one of the outputs from this meeting perhaps might be uh, <coughs> an article that uh, synthesizes or summarizes what we've all come up with. And uh, we have a journal called Solutions that, that is a hybrid academic and popular uh, magazine that tries to reach across academic disciplines, also out to the policy community, but in, in a way that's, we call it, seriously creative. Uh, and more than a third of our articles can be about describing the problem, and two thirds have to be about describing the, the solution. So I <coughs> encourage you to take a look at this and maybe think about uh, publishing some of your uh, solutions here. Okay, thanks. <coughs>